bankruptcy, divorce laws, disability, probate, there are so many classes on the path to practicing law. Unfortunately, most schools fail to instruct you on the business of law. This is Solo De Facto, a show dedicated to discovering the success secrets that exist in the reality of running a solo practice. My goal is to find the one thing that separates each guest from the rest to give you practical solutions to create a thriving firm. Solo De Facto is sponsored by Back Office Betty's, trusted virtual legal receptionist. Welcome, everyone. We are here today for another episode of Solo De Facto. I am really excited to have a highly skilled family law attorney uh, at Beerman LLP, Katie Michelson. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Um, So I want to get right into it and just ask you the pressing question. What is the one thing that you wish attorneys knew about running a successful law firm? Oh, it's a lot. I mean, one thing is it's kind of hard to um, say one thing, but I think um, that I think that getting clients has a lot to do with who you are as, as a person and that it's important to be your authentic self and that your reputation um, precedes you so that getting clients um, takes work and it takes making sure that your reputation among your colleagues, your clients and so forth really helps drive the business. So kind of maintaining that reputation, I think, is really, really crucial for people to know. Okay. And so where, where's the first step if you are thinking about a reputation, because I feel like most people aren't even considering that. What is the first thing that you need to do to make sure that that's, um, that your reputation is preceding you in a positive way? Um, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process. So what I always say to people is that, you know, your reputation takes a long time to build. So, I mean, it's kind of a broad concept. What are some of the things that you can do? Um, Reputation comes to who you hire, to how you handle cases, to how you develop business, Um, really putting yourself out there as um, the go-to in the field, not just for your knowledge of the area of law, but your ability to relate to your clients. So being all accessible, being honest, um, being transparent with your clients, with your business contacts, with the people that you network with. Um, so that's, I think, kind of a broad overview of what I'm talking about. And, and I think it's something that people really overlook in a practice, um, because, you know, we're all intelligent attorneys. Well, I I hope we all are intelligent attorneys and we all graduated from law school. So we know the basics of, of being a lawyer. Um, but one of the things that I don't think that they talk about is, the importance in in law school, and they shouldn't because this comes with experience, but the importance of reputation, the importance of maintaining a practice of integrity and kind of keeping that at the forefront in coloring everything that you do. Would you say that your reputation includes um, like customer service aspects or are you considering more of like personality wise or both? I, I think it's I think it's both. I mean, I think that there's there's so many areas where reputation and authenticity sh- shines through. And I, and I think that that comes from how you practice to how you deal with clients, to how you treat people within your firm, um, mentoring, um, being available for those who you work with, um, either as you know a, a, a colleague on the same level or for people that are starting to work with you. Um, so I, I think it's on so many different levels that that is as long as you remain authentic and have a rep, you know reputation that you are happy to hang out for everyone to see. Um, that's the most important thing. And I mean, we can talk about different aspects of it, but I think that's kind of a general overview of it. Okay. And so when you're considering um, an attorney who has a good reputation and that is driving and growing their business, what are the certain things that you'd be looking for? Or what is it that you try to have in your firm to make sure that your reputation is what you're wanting it to be? So I think, I mean, let's, let's talk about it from, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to talk about it. So there's, let's talk about like client management. Okay. So 
you know, we have a lot of different aspects from where we get our reputation, where we get people to think positively about us as practicing attorneys, as business owners, as mentors. Um, obviously, one of the most crucial points that we need to focus on is our clients. And your clients need to know that you are somebody that they can depend upon and that when you are giving them advice, whether it's good advice, I'm sorry, whether it's advice that talks about the good or advice that talks about the bad, it's being upright, uh, upfront, it's being, um, uh, you know, really kind of laying out very specifically what people can expect. So it, there's a there's a process of building that trust with the client. And I think what comes from that is being responsive, um, being honest, telling clients what they might not want to hear, um, because I think that that commands more respect than being a yes person. Um, you know, one of the things that I always say to people when I'm interviewing clients, and people always say about clients interviewing you, but I think it's really important you're also interviewing clients, is to tell them that I'm going to say things that you might not like. And especially in the divorce route, you know, as a family law attorney, I have plenty of times where there's, you know, it's, it's a tough road and there needs to be a really frank conversation about what an outcome can be. So being very honest and being very transparent with clients about what a possible outcome could be and not immediately ceding to demands, but to say, Hey, have you thought about this? Or have you thought about, you know, that and making sure that that kind of honest conversation happens and, and, and is from the outset of your relationship that you that you have that honest conversation and not just be a yes person um in terms of you know the the real basics you know we all know we need to get back to our clients on a timely basis we need to answer their questions fully without deflecting we have to listen i mean one of the, the easiest ways to keep your clients happy is to listen to them which sounds it, it sounds pretty like pretty much like a no-brainer, but most attorneys already have it in their mind about what they want to say next. So having a reputation as a listener and somebody who's going to sit and process allows for that reputation among your clients to really flourish. Yeah, absolutely. Because that feeling of not being heard it can almost turn you off faster than anything else. Even if you're not necessarily, I'm speaking from a client perspective, but even if you're not necessarily, um, you know, appreciating that you are being heard, if you're not being heard, you're going to notice that and it's going to damage your relationship with whoever it is that you're trying to um, trust, you know? Yeah. So I, I fully appreciate that. Yeah, and I think, I think what you just kind of, um, hit on is not being heard in addition to the fact that you might get aggravated by your attorney because you don't feel like the message is getting across you stop listening so you stop listening to the advice that the attorney is giving because you're focusing on the fact that you feel like your goals are not being um, appreciated or heard um and you know we as attorneys are hired because we are knowledgeable in our field you know people come to me as a family law attorney because i've been doing it for a while I've seen all different kinds of outcomes. I've seen different situations. So people come to me as an expert, and I'm not really supposed to use the word expert, but it's the easiest way that I could say as somebody who knows what they're doing as it comes to family law issues. Um, but, you know, so, so there is a sense of coming to me and asking for that counsel because that's why I'm hired. I mean, I'm hired to provide honest, um, you know, quality counsel in situations that might be really difficult for people to understand that being said sometimes shutting my mouth and listening to what somebody has to say you gather so much more information and then you you continue to keep the um, respect of your clients that makes so much sense so if you are considering the reputation but the aspect of the customer um management portion, what is the worst thing you can do aside from not listening? <laughs> There's so many bad things that you, that, that one can fall into. Um, I think I especially see lack of 
explanation, you know, lack of information to my clients being really, really detrimental for a number of reasons. I always say this to my clients, you know, no one gets, and, and this is in the divorce context, I handle more than just, you know, helping people through a divorce process, but in a divorce context, you know, nobody gets married to get divorced. So it's a very foreign concept. And it's almost, you know, you, you, you don't want to dumb things down because you want to obviously have respect for your clients. So you don't want to bring it down to a level that's so elementary that seems disrespectful. But explaining and educating is so important and your failure to do so can be so detrimental to a case. And that is anything from when you have a meeting with a client, really walking them through the process in a very elementary way to say when you send orders to a client or something that happened from court, really explaining in that respect what happened. The, the reason why I think it can be dangerous, especially in uh, really highly contentious areas of law where there's really high emotions, is that people aren't, their mindset is not equipped to, to understand things as, as they normally would. There's very high emotion, there's high stress. And so where you would think that somebody might get it, they're in a situation where they're so stressed out, they're so unnerved by everything that's going on that where you think somebody would understand it, they don't. And the reason why that could be so detrimental to a case is because you might be going in one direction and your client may be wishing that you're going in a different direction. So not having those instructional conversations, those instructional follow-ups, um, the checking in to making sure that they really get it. And that might happen more than, you know, one time, two times, three times, just really making sure that people understand what it is you're trying to accomplish here. I think that can be really detrimental to a case. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think something that a lot of people who do expert level work like attorneys, or even um, in my case, trying to explain what I'm doing in a marketing role, you get so used to your job and it seems so simple. And then you try to explain something to somebody else and they're just wondering what the heck you're talking about. And if you don't lower it down, you're actually in a lot of cases, not even going to seem like, you know, as much as you do, because you're trying almost like too hard or considered to be trying too hard using giant words that make no sense to the person listening to where they're like, do you even know what you're talking about? And I've had that happen to me before where I really didn't understand to where it seemed like somebody was maybe, um, you know, overcompensating almost that they were trying to seem like they knew more than they did. And I lost all confidence in them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, especially when you have situations where it's really high stress, because in those situations, you're even doubly not processing um, and you're heightened to maybe being a little bit more critical of somebody who's trying to explain the things to you. Um, so I agree with you, the using of big words, you know, we, we tend to, you know, because for example, we're, you know, our, our Illinois Marriage and Dissolution of Marriage Act is what I call our, our Bible, right? So it's what we as divorce attorneys here in, here in Illinois will focus on um, when we're trying to get people through the divorce process um, and, you know, using the acronyms and using certain things that people aren't familiar with, it can be very um, distracting. And I agree with you. You have to remember who, who it is you're talking to, because that's all part of the educational process. That's part of how do I get my client to feel educated and allowing them to feel in control. In a, in a process where most people feel completely out of control. So that educational point of, of really getting a client to understand from a really basic level what it is you're doing, it cannot be overstated. Definitely. So do you have any, I know you've been um, an attorney for quite a while, and do you have any experiences that you can think of where you made a mistake that you were actually um, worried that your reputation might have taken some damage? Well, the good news is I feel like it's been hammered into me from my very 
early years of practicing. So I've been with Bierman now um, for coming on 17 years. And I started with the firm as a law clerk. I was clerking in law school and then I just stayed and I've been there ever since. Um, so one of the things that was really hammered into me is all you have is your reputation. And at the time that you um, do something that could damage it, you know, all is lost and you can't really build that back up. And I, that's always been taught to me. And it's something that I really, really take to heart. So I wouldn't say that I have a lot of experiences where I feel like I might've damaged my reputation. I do feel that I have, and, and every attorney learns, um, no matter how many years you've been practicing and whether you're a new attorney or you've been, you're a seasoned attorney, um, we all have experiences where we kind of look back and say, that didn't align with my reputation. That didn't align with what I wanted to do. And one of my big themes for this year is really finding clients that fit my philosophy and how I practice. And it fits what I think is important for people to get out of the process. And while it's not necessarily um, something that I thought would be you know, harmful to my reputation, sometimes when you, you and, and often you just don't know, you take clients that just don't align with your philosophy and it causes you because you're trying to solve problems for them, it causes you to perhaps act in a way or take on an approach that ultimately was not your core approach of how you do that. And you find yourself kind of slipping into what a client wants. You need to bring yourself back to what a client needs. I mean, those are kind of the key things. And from a reputation standpoint, kind of understanding how you are as an attorney and how you practice, it's very tempting to want to be who your client wants you to be. They're the ones that are paying the bills or hopefully paying the bills. <laughs> hopefully they're paying their invoices. Um, but they're the ones who are paying their bills. They're the ones who are, you know, your bread and butter. And without clients, we obviously wouldn't have a practice to run and we wouldn't be able to build on our reputation and get more clients. So I do think that, and, and I think if I speak to any attorney about this, um, again, these are like, these are very seasoned attorneys saying to me, you know what, I shouldn't have taken on that client because it caused me to act in a manner that I really wasn't proud of how I acted. I've usually been pretty good about severing relationships with those clients because at the end of the day, and we've all had it, you know, the client that takes up 80% of our brain space, you know, there's that person that you um, are, are, you want to help. And unfortunately it's, it's difficult to accomplish what they want you to accomplish for, for a variety of reasons. So that's been kind of an interesting experience and and one that I'm constantly working at in terms of who I bring on as clients. And I think many attorneys would relate to that. That's an amazing way to answer that difficult question. <laughs> you did a really great job. <laughs> Can you tell that I used to be in public relations? Right? Oh, well, now it makes sense. That was um, a definitely a great way to answer that. So You've mentioned before that you should treat your law firm as a service business. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah, I think that, you know, we're service professionals and service professionals means that we're, you're, you're, you're focused on service and focusing on service means your client is, you know, your most important asset. Um, you know, we don't manufacture widgets. We ultimately, as attorneys, um, make sure that people are serviced in the right way. So making sure that you are servicing their needs, again, I mean, going back to reputation and making sure that your client focused, um, I think is really, really important. It's, it's, it conflicts with the idea that you have to put food on the table and you have to bring in money for your firm to be sustainable. Um, but from my perspective, if you, if you focus away from being client focused, you know, that, that, 
bread and butter stops. So you have to always remember now, does that mean the client always is right? No. In some industries, it might mean that. And maybe some practitioners will say that. But I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that. I think that, you know, there's room for debate and there's room for um, discussion on what's appropriate. A client might think something's appropriate for themselves and you as their hired professional think something different. Um, but um you know, still it's client focused, it's service focused, and it's really important for, um, you know, attorneys to, to, to remember that, especially when you're running a firm. Would you say that it's more important to have a good relationship than to get a good outcome? Or would you say that um, the outcome would still be more important to the client, regardless of the relationship? It's a hard, it, well, that's kind of a tough question because outcomes, so, so the, what we as family law attorneys will often say is the most successful outcome is when no one is happy because it ultimately means that there was some give and there was some getting, um, there was some push and pull. And so an outcome can't necessarily be the measure of success. Sometimes it is, you know, we win, we win motions, we win cases. And when I say win cases, you know, the ultimate win is obviously people get divorced in a divorce situation. So it's not really a win because it's, it's, you know, a changing of, of a family dynamic. So it's not really to call it a win. It's more of a transition. Um, so outcomes in, in the family law realm, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to say a good outcome is a measure of success. I am more of the opinion that trust by clients is a much more successful outcome from my perspective because the end result can often be really painful and you know i have a i always have a great story to tell i have a client who um many years ago ago i divorced and she's kept in touch with me and her process was really really painful um, but she's kept in touch with me to show where she is now. And she's shared with me, you know, things with her kids. She shared with me, that she got remarried. You know, she sent me pictures showing her life and saying, you know, at the point that I was, I never thought I'd be where I am now. And, you know, you were a big part of that. That to me doesn't mean that the outcome ultimately during the process was, was that great because it was really, really tough, but it means the client trusts me enough to share these things with me. She feels that I would appreciate it because I went through all these ups and downs with her. And that's a client that I'm really, I'm really proud to have that relationship with that client because then I've done my job. That's amazing. Um, I want to kind of transition a little bit and learn more about how you got to where you are and how you got to have this um, view on reputation. I know that you kind of touched on it was ingrained in you um, from the beginning, but tell me your life story of how you got to where you are and how you got to that beginning to, to learn about reputation. Right. So I, um, I don't have a traditional start to my law career. So um, I think I alluded to this in, in the way that I spin, spin stories. Um, so I, I, um, you know, I grew up in the Chicago area and went away for college, to the University of Michigan. And when I was done and I came back, um, I had always want, I, I had a degree in sociology and I was very interested in, in kind of human behavior. So I began working in um, public relations. So I did a lot of consumer public relations where it was a lot of really fun stuff like, you know, in your 20s doing media tours and, and fun campaigns and, you know, for every brand that you would think of. You know, I went to the Super Bowl. I, um, you know, I did an event with um, Layla Ali. I mean, I did some really, really fun stuff. Um, my father um, is retired, but he was um, a practicing attorney, commercial real estate, um, transactional. And uh, I have a grandfather who um, was a law professor and um, taught civil procedure and I just and my sister's a lawyer and and you know I just kind of came from a whole family of lawyers but I was you know hell-bent on not being a lawyer because everybody else was a lawyer so um really I I think I hit 
after year seven of working at some really phenomenal agencies and having a lot of fun, I was going to turn 30 and I thought, you know, I'm not married. I don't have children. I'm not really connected, committed to anything that requires me to, you know, to kind of think twice about it. So I decided to go to law school and I threw in the towel and I quit my job and I went to Chicago, Kent and started law school. And I was an older student. So that was a real big, it was a really big, um, shake up of my world because I was so used to being in charge of from a professional standpoint and then going back and getting graded was was kind of a, a, a reality uh, that I wasn't really used to. So um, I took advantage of everything that I could in law school. I, you know, lived in Italy. I worked in China. I did some all some pretty cool things. And then um, I was able to get my start at Beerman. And really it was it was I want to say it was, you know, sending out all my resumes to the best family law firms. I, I was very lucky because I had a good connection here. Um, but what happened was I really found that this was an area of law that suited me. And it was really an organic thing. Um, I started working with some pretty phenomenal mentors, Miles Beerman, who's the um, owner of the firm, founder of the firm. Um, Took me under his wing, some my my now fellow partner, who's the managing partner, um, again, mentor of me. And I ended up just really falling into it. But what I loved about it and what I continue to love about it is it requires it's one of these areas of law that really requires creativity, a very even temperament. Um, a commanding of the room where you can get the uh, where you can get the trust of the people that you represent and the people that you work with, and it's so important because it's in, it's such an emotional area and it's such a tumultuous area an ever changing area. So it it really combined everything that I had loved about sociology, which was really kind of a study of populations. PR, because you really get to read people and read situations. It's never more important to be able to read your judges, read witnesses, clients, and other colleagues, and, and, and really try to, um, to integrate all of that and consider all of that in this process as you're trying to get people into new life situations. So it organically came to be. Um, and, you know, my parents have been married 56 years. So I, you know, my role model has been different from having, a, you know, a, I, I don't come from a divorced family. Um, but that has also shown me, you know, what's valuable in a marriage and, and where are things that are, um, you know, no marriage is perfect and, and no family relationship is perfect. So it's also taught me um, a lot of different kind of different um, perspectives on human dynamics, evolution of relationships. And from a business standpoint, it really just fit my personality. So I'm proud to say that I'm the only owner equity partner firm that was a law clerk. And I really kind of came up through, you know, hard work, sweat equity. Um, and, you know, that's where I am today. That's amazing. Um, I never would have guessed that PR and being an attorney would you know, work together like that, but it makes sense when you've laid it out of the way that you need to read people. And so now I'm curious because obviously PR and reputation go hand in hand. Was there anything when you were working in PR that you saw happening that you're like, wow, they just wrecked their reputation and you make sure nobody else does this? Yeah. And, and that's a great connection. And it's, <laughs> I'm glad you made that connection because that's a really good connection. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, we would have situations when we were handling these companies where there was a lot of crisis communications that was required, right? So reputation, of course, gets hand in hand with crisis. And, um, you know, words, words are really important. Um, how, especially when, when we would be writing press releases or we'd be trying to pitch stories and, um, you know, a reputation of a company could really be um, made or broken with words. And with 
And words are really, really important in law, which is obviously a very elementary concept, but it really is. I mean, you think about it is it's not just the written word. It's also your body language. It's your, um, how you communicate to your clients, to your colleagues, to if you're a litigator, to the judge, um, it's those. And so what comes from words and it, it all kind of funnels into reputation, um, the ability to relate um, for people to. So I saw plenty of situations where words were probably used in a way that they shouldn't have been or they were. Um, you know, it, 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 it probably should have been phrased in a different way or and, and that really gave the wrong message. So again, PR messaging, um, having a theme, you know, all these things are really important in the PR world. And that really, um, I've seen where it's gone wrong. I've also obviously seen where it's gone wrong in the family law sense, because how you communicate your reputation and all these different things can really change the trajectory of a case your relationships with, you know, other attorneys, your clients and that sort of thing. So it's definitely interrelated and it, it requires you to be, you know, really on top of it. You know, you have to be on top of every, every word can be um, twisted. You know, when we talk about, I, I speak about this with my clients about how important the written word is in, um, for example, a marital settlement agreement. Um, which is the financial aspect of a divorce where if you, by agreement, can settle the matters of, of support and asset division and, and, um, and so forth. Um, it, the wrong words can really hurt you in the end of and that type of agreement. And it also, you know, that's why I'm saying that words and, and communication kind of make, can often make or break a case and can make things either really good and could be positive or could be really, really difficult. That makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider that as an attorney, you are being perceived in so many different people um, that are all looking at you in a different way or different um, angle, that you have to be careful that your perception is what you're hoping it to be, right? Yeah, I mean, you can't control everyone, right? As we all know, as human beings, you know, you're not going to be able to control what everyone, how they perceive you. There's going to be things outside of your control. But to the extent that you have the control over certain aspects is, um, you know, grab that control because there are certain things that, that you are not going to be able to control. So the extent you can, you know, it, it's even more important. Absolutely. So I want to um, move on a little bit further again and ask kind of what's coming up for you that you're really excited about this year. Is there anything um, that you just want to dish about? <laughs> well, um, you know, the landscape's ever changing. So we have some interesting developments going on um, in family law, as always. Um, you know, COVID's been tough on everyone and there's been some there's been some really um, interesting, difficult topics that that we as family law practitioners have been dealing with. Um, a lot of it has surrounded, you know, children um, and issues with um, uh, vaccinations and and dealing with COVID related issues. And while not, you know, exciting, it it keeps my it keeps me on my toes and it keeps me constantly thinking. So. Um, I, I really enjoy the ever-changing landscape. So from a professional standpoint, um, I'm excited to continually have these, the challenges that come before me because it keeps me on my toes and it keeps my job interesting. From a, you know, I'm, one exciting thing is um, I am the new president of the Chicago Council for the American Writers Museum here in Chicago, and that is the only museum in the United States that's dedicated to um, American writers. And so I'm a member of uh, one of their fundraising arms of professionals, um, and um, we're bringing awareness to the museum. So there's going to be a lot of great events that we're going to do with that museum. Um, so we're super excited. I'm, I'm super excited about that. Um, and I'm just going to continue to hone my skills, you know, client development, current and future client development, um, making sure I'm on the speaking circuit and the writing circuit, 
um, and doing what I can to um, contribute to the community. Chicago's great, so there's really a lot of opportunities. And I just feel like 2022 has to be better than 2021. <laughs> there's just, I mean, it has to be. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's very exciting, though. Um, congratulations. And um, so I guess my final question for you is where can people find you if they want to connect or um, learn more about you? Where can yeah. they find you? So the easiest way is to email me and, um, you know, phone. I, you know, as we all are on our cell phones these days, but I, you know, get phone, email, um, through my website, um, which is beermanlaw.com. Um, you can find um, me on my website. Um, and I also have um, a, a Facebook professional professional page, um, which I'm assuming you're going to, um, I can give you the links to that, um, as well as um, I'm on LinkedIn. So I, I've tried to make myself as accessible as possible. Um, you know, one of the things that I have found is, you know, it's interesting, clients come to me from a lot of different sources. So um, really, I am, um, I'm, I'm very accessible, maybe to a fault. Um, but you can always reach out to me those in those ways. And I'll be sure to get back to you. Perfect. We will um, make sure those are in the show notes too. So anyone listening can quickly grab the links. Um, well, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. And um, anyone listening, if you've learned something today or enjoyed this episode of Solo De Facto, um, please share it with someone else who might get some value from it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's show. For more information, visit our site at solodefacto.com. And remember, smash that like and subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. Solo De Facto is sponsored by Back Office Betty's, trusted virtual legal receptionist, helping you grow your firm one call, one chat, one new client at a time. To discover how they can help you grow your firm, head on over to backofficebetties.com and mention the Solo De Facto show for an exclusive listener offer.